Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. I'm Deanna, your host for today's session. I'm here with Carly and James, sister and father of Maddie Holleran. Maddie Holleran was an all-American teenager in Allendale, New Jersey. She was a star athlete. She was an exceptional soccer player and an incredible track runner. She also excelled in academics and she was socially popular and well liked by anyone who came in contact with her. Um, she was a role model um, in her community and also she had a really great group of close friends. She was also surrounded by a very loving and supportive family. By all accounts, she had an amazing, beautiful, wonderful life. And her Instagram and social media also reflected everything perfect and everything calm and everything happy. Her second semester of her freshman year at UPenn, unfortunately, Maddie died by suicide on January 17th, 2014. In the ensuing years after that, uh, this wonderful author named Kate Fagan took the time and the care to really dive deeply into the story and to make sure that she did justice to Maddie and her life and the wonderful life that she had lived. She also wanted to find out what made Maddie run, which is the title of her book. And with that also came with how Maddie lived her life and what she presented and how that sort of I don't want to say deceptive, but was a little bit untrue to what was really happening in the background. And this is why we have Maddie's sister and Maddie's father with us. And they have founded the Maddie Holleran Foundation, which actually touches on the problems with presenting a perfect life on Instagram, also with the stresses of being a star track athlete at an Ivy League Division I school and all the pressures that come with that. And without going too into it with my part, I'm gonna let them speak. So welcome and thank you. My biggest thanks to you is actually, thank you so much for opening up your life to Kate Fagan so that she can do this type of work and write this kind of story. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to have essentially a stranger come in and say, hey, may I have access to all of her emails and all of her text messages and everything. Um, it's very personal as well and to just have to keep talking about it. So my first question is to you, how did you come to that decision when Kate approached you? What was, what was that like? Well, we first met Kate um, when she came to us when working for ESPNW and they wanted to do a story on Madison and an article essentially called Split Image that focused on uh, her social media representation versus her real life and what was going on. So when we first met Kate to do that, um, we instantly liked her. Uh, we knew that she was relatable, that she understood our story and Madison's story. Um, the book touches on it as well, but Kate had suffered a little bit in, in college too, being an, a college athlete and having mm -hmm. to focus a lot on that. And ultimately like wanted to quit at one point as well. So we knew that she was the right person to tell Madison's story. And she was also just very likable, very friendly. Uh, our family kind of uh, was drawn to her almost immediately. And so after she worked on the article that um, was based on Madison, she said, you know, this is really important to me. This is really touching to me. And I would love it if you guys would allow me to write a book about Madison. And I mean, I don't know about you, but personally, mm -hmm. I don't think it was ever really a question. I think we were like, go for it. You know, you're the right person to do this, so. Yeah, I thought that um Kate, we felt very comfortable with, like Carly was saying, everybody felt really, you know, comfortable that, uh, and especially after reading the article that she did and also the, the interview that was part of the, um, the article, I think we, she really got Madison's story correct and she was, you know, really had a very close, um, I think, almost like a relationship with her, even though she never knew her. I feel like yeah. that from the book that it's almost as if the two people had met like Kate had met Maddie yeah. um, and the one thing that this book was so important to me too is that I feel like I can relate to Maddie even though she's decades younger than me and lived a very different life um, just some of the struggles that were present um, are some of the struggles that I've gone through as well and I the way that this story is told um, everyone can relate to the social media 
pressure right. of feeling, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of people can relate to, especially in the run, running community, of like being perfect, right. and also the platitudes of if you're struggling, it's mind over matter, and just just push through it. You know, you can do anything you put your mind to, right. and mm-hmm. positive thoughts will solve everything. Um, and I know that this book was sort of to tell her story and maybe come to the conclusion of, well, why did she do it? Spoiler alert, there's no one reason. It's a very complicated, layered thing that happens. Um, Mm. But I wanna know, as you were going through the process of talking with Kate and having her interview you and all your friends and everyone that Maddie knew, was there, were were you hoping for something more? Like to, maybe that there would be one reason or is there anything that was, not shocking, but was there anything that you learned from the process that was surprising to you that maybe you didn't even know or realize? I mean, I learned that Madison was going to church at the end, um, Mm -hmm. which I had not known beforehand. Um, I think Kate had talked to some of her friends and they had told us that, um, but I was not currently aware of it before Kate came in Mm -hmm. and told us that. So I thought that was really interesting. I mean, um, Madison and our dad like were raised Catholic and um, so she was confirmed and like grew up in the church, but I never knew that it was like very important to her. So I think to see that at the end of her life, that she, that was like where she went for um, a source of help and uh, some solace. Like I think that was that was very interesting and um, it made me feel a little bit better. You know, like she was looking for God at the end. So I found that out when Kate was doing the story, and I found that to be very interesting. But that was probably one of the only things that I hadn't known that came up. Yeah, I, I would say I, um, I think everything in the book I pretty much knew too, except for you know some of the details about the church, which um, you know I was also I, I glad to hear, and you know because I um, rely on um, my faith a lot, and it's you know I think for her to know that she was also reaching out, you know, mm-hmm. um, and going to church was. I mean, it's kind of soothing that um, she had that connection at the end. Yeah, it's a great word for it, soothing. Um, So bouncing off of that, in the time afterward, you created the Madison Hallern Foundation, and that's to go out and educate rising freshmen Mm -hmm. um, about the pressures and what to expect when they enter college, and specifically student athletes, am I correct on that? or it's more it's, inclusive we than try that, to, Yeah, we try to be broad. Um, I think actually in the beginning it really started as that, um, a very strong focus to rising freshmen, um, to high schools graduating in, in to, to go into college. Um, but I just feel like as we've expanded, we've just met so many people that do suffer from mental illness and it can be anybody from you know, a 12 year old to a 50 year old. Um, so I think we've definitely broadened our reach for mm-hmm. sure. And even just the people that we talk to, like uh, we've done speaking engagements before. I, I know I've spoken to colleges and um, younger schools, but we've done corporate events and even spoken to communities um, around our area at mm-hmm. community events. And it's shocking to see how many people relate to Madison's story, no matter their mm-hmm. age, and also how many people are also suffering from um, mental illness and have just been nervous to speak up about it. So we like to be able to talk to them because I think by us talking to them, but also by reading the book, it gives them an outlet to say, hey, like I'm suffering too. Um, I know a lot of, I've talked to a lot of parents who have read the book and it gave them an outlet to say, hey, like to their kids, did you read this? Are you suffering? Is there anything you want to talk about? Whereas previously they might not have had the opportunity to bring up that conversation or felt strong enough to do that before, so. After talking with other parents and other family members, have, has your view of what happened changed or um, the way that you have coped with it and moved on, has that changed or expanded anything? I think for me it's, it's uh, easier now. And um, I mean, I think the, you know, the, like these talks and going out with Carly actually makes it even easier because I feel like now we're really helping people. and. Um, you know, there's so many people that need help. Like we, we tried to focus in on like high school seniors and, you know, college freshmen, but I think, you know, Mm -hmm. we're finding out it's just so much broader than that. To bring it back also to what you were asking before, I think that was maybe like the one thing that we focused on right when it happened, like, oh, it was her transition to college. So like Mm -hmm. that was, that was it. That was what did it. So that's what Mm -hmm. we need to 
find in others and fix and help. But okay. I think now that we've, you know, just learn more about other people and how they suffer and maybe more about what Madison was going through, it shows that it's, like you said, never just one thing. So it could be, it could be anything. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's all another reason why we've kind of just broadened and try to talk to other people, help other people as much as possible. How have you tried to change the language around the conversation? Um, this, and specifically this book talks about how Maddie would text people and let, sort of let people know what was happening, but then she would do, put in an emoji with like a monkey <laughs> covering his yeah. eyes, you know, and there's like, it lightens the brevity of the situation. Mm. And even though um, people knew that there were issues going on, like every, like the family, I am blown away by, by the love and the care that comes through in this book with that, especially, um, and how you were doing all the right things, all the things that you knew to do. And I, I have to go back to this quote where, mm. I believe it was you who said it, that one day Maddie was happy, one day, she wasn't, and then the next day she was gone, and it seemed to have happened so fast. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how you address that with the incoming freshmen and how to talk about it and with the language of emojis and text messages and Instagram, um, how is that being presented to them? Well, I think Kate um, actually touched on it a lot. She mentions it in the book, but she mm -hmm. touched on it a lot in the article that she had originally wrote. Um, about how these are the highlights, they're not the whole story. Right. And I just think that her stating that was like the perfect representation of social media in general. You know, everyone yeah. goes on to post these perfect, probably highly edited <laughs> photos of their, their lives and um, they look great and it's a, it's a great way to share with people you're not physically close to, you know, if they're living across the country, across the world, you can share your life. But it needs, people need to know, and especially teens um, and young adults need to know that this is not the whole story, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that was one thing that Madison did kind of suffer with. Like, she was able to recognize in herself, because she did tell our, our mom when our mom said, you know, you look so happy in all these photos. She was like, mom, it's just a picture, right. you know? So she recognized it in herself, but I don't know if she was able to see that in others because then she was like, well, my friends just look like they're having such a good time at, at college or, you know, a lot of my classmates from high school look like they're having so much fun. So I think it was definitely something that she struggled with. And I think that Kate did a really good job of bringing that to the forefront and talking about social media and how, you know, it only kind of shows the good usually and not the bad, so. <laughs> I struggle with that as an adult, right. even. I see I'm a mom and I see all these other moms leaving these beautiful lives and I'm like, why can't I do that? And right. It's, it's such a spiral. Their kids look um, happy all the time. <laughs> yeah, everything's clean and neat and they're like super physically fit and I can't get out of bed and yeah. they vomit on me. <laughs> what are they doing that I'm not doing? I totally understand that. And so when you're talking with the students, the incoming students and their families, what are some of the ways that you prepare them for that, if, if you have any tips on, to the parents especially? Because another thing I found fascinating about this book is that some of the other parents, um, and I kind of chalked this up to them having grown up without social media, right. um, that they were able to look at Maddie's Instagram from the outside and be like, hmm, interesting. That's yeah. not really real. And one of the parents actually said that all her friends were too close to it mm -hmm. and just didn't really see um, the darkness that kind of lurked behind there. So when you're talking to parents at these conferences, um, what's some advice that you give to them when they're looking through their kids' Instagram feeds or social media feeds? Well, I think first of all, it's to realize that what is shown on social media is probably five to 10% of their actual life. Um, so again, it's just a picture or it's just a small video. So it's not the representation of what's really going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, anybody can go out for an hour and smile in a photo and then go home and proceed to cry themselves to sleep or have an anxiety attack or whatever it is. So I think that that's the first thing that they need to know. Um, the second is also just to start a conversation. There's nothing wrong. I think a lot of people are, especially parents, are so worried about going up to their their kids, their young adults, and saying, you know, have you ever thought about suicide? Are you depressed? Uh, do you have anxiety? Is something wrong? And they don't need to be afraid of that. Having a conversation and starting that conversation is the first step to helping them because sometimes your kids might be too scared to come up and tell you the truth, but I guarantee you if you just start by asking them the question, they're gonna feel a lot safer and more inclined to open up to you. Yeah, it's a very loaded question. Mm -hmm. Just to, I mean, even a close loved one that obviously you raised, but just be like, hey, are these dark thoughts going through your mind? Right. Um, I, 
I can't even imagine what it would have been like if someone close to me had asked me that during my time. And I, I feel like I possibly would have just lied and said, no, yeah, everything's fine, everything's fine, I'm totally fine. Well, that's and also the other important point is right. to follow up, you know? So the like maybe follow. they're gonna say, yes, I'm fine. But then mm -hmm. if you keep following up, they might realize, you know, oh, okay, they really do care. They really wanna know. They really are interested in my life and what's going on. So mm -hmm. I think it's important for them to feel safe, that this is a safe space for them to talk. And maybe, um, I know that like my parents got Madison a therapist to talk to because they were like, you know, maybe if you don't yeah. want to open up to us or talk to yeah. us about this, we can find somebody that you can feel honest with and, and talk to. And I think also um, you were in some of the sessions with Madison, mm -hmm. but you, last one. Yeah, yeah, but you also, he had also stated that like, you know, Madison, if you want to go in there and you feel like you're going to open up more and be more honest with your therapist, he was like, I'll sit out. Right. Um, so, you know, that's important as well. So in that last, um, session that you had with Maddie, mm -hmm. the therapist was able to make Maddie feel safe enough to admit that she had suicidal thoughts and right. to also ask her, or to sure. have her say that she won't act on them. Correct. Um, yeah. And this is, I think, from the book or the yeah. article, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. you, I remember reading that you didn't believe it. Like no. you, something was off about that. She, she looked away from both of us when mm -hmm. she answered the question. Yeah. So any parents that are going through this right now, um, right. how would you have them approach that or breach that? Because you, you still followed up in the aftermath yeah. after that session, I should say. I think one thing that I didn't know enough of was that a lot of colleges and universities have a leave of absence policy. Oh. And yeah. you know, it's, it's all right if to really pursue taking a leave of absence you know, for a medical reason. So that's what I would encourage. I mean, if they really think their child is in any danger, to really explore, you know, what what ha what the leave of absence policy is at the college or university. Because I think I don't know if it would have changed anything, but at least um, it's an option. It, for it's other an people. option, right? You know, to take it for a semester. You mm -hmm. know, usually they'll they'll give the um, student off for a semester, and a lot of them, um, you know, will go home and and then they'll go back after a semester after getting you know proper help and on medication and therapy sessions. Uh, I mean, that's what I think could have been a good option for Madison had we had you know more time. You know, yeah. that's, um, I, I, I actually learned that afterwards, you know. I so, didn't even but, know that. I know. Yeah, us. so. It's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. I have to check yeah. with my school. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Um, so you both, if I'm correct, you both had a big part in getting the Madison Holler, Holler in um, Suicide Prevention Act passed in New Jersey. Am I naming that correct? Um, it actually was Madison's former fifth grade teacher who was oh, the spoke. driving okay. force for that. Um, we wholeheartedly supported him and were willing to, you know, do anything that he needed us to do, whether it was get signatures or just, you know promote the cause on social media, get the word out. Um, but yeah, he was really the driving force behind that and he he worked his butt off to, to get that done. So that yeah, was really that was did. great. And yeah, that was unbelievable. But, yeah. And it's just, the synopsis of that, it's just, mm -hmm. it's a law that requires institutions of learning to have access to mental health for the students around the clock, correct? Right. Yes, for our right. correct. Mm -hmm. And it's been implemented, so it's like moving through the schools now, yes. apparently, right? Yes. Yeah. Have you talked with any families or p students who have benefited from that law since then? Or is it still a little bit too new to have that? I think it's still a little yeah. too new. I mean, I haven't spoken to anyone. I don't know about you, but... Um, no, I haven't. I haven't either. Um, but I, I did talk to one mother that this was actually before it became a law, and she was concerned <clears throat> about her daughter, and um, her daughter actually had sent a um, suicidal text to her ex-boyfriend that they had just broken up. And, you know, so we were talking, my advice to the mother was, well, you gotta go see your daughter right away. Yeah. And she, she did, and actually her daughter got hospitalized. Mm -hmm. But it all worked out, you know. She was just hospitalized for three days and took the medical, you know, everything took its course and everything worked out well. Oh, that's good. So, yeah, but uh, not, not really as a result of the legislation, which is the New Jersey legislation. Right, right. I'm so. like hoping for 
other places to adopt that. I know. I know right. Virginia is actually that we have there have some people working in Virginia to get it um, approved there as well. But yeah, it's just New Jersey right now. Okay, and I know that the NCAA in general yeah. has sort of put forth a push to make yes. mental health access yeah. more readily available to all students, but also to not neglect the student athletes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and being a coach at a school myself, I can see how at other institutions how that could be very isolating for the student athletes. And it's talked about in the book how there is this just idea that they should be able to move through anything and that it's all about grit and determination and that it's if they quit because they need to mm -hmm. for their own mental health, they might be seen as weak. Mm -hmm. Whether the coach actually thinks that or not, it's a lot of pressure on the student athletes themselves. Yeah. Um, how is the conversation about that particular area um, changed or how, what's the direction that you guys want to push that conversation when you go to your talks? Um, like when you address, mm. when you talk to coaches, like me, mm. yeah. how about this? Like what would you say to me if you thought I was doing something incorrect or harmful? Like how would you approach it and what are some tips that you would give a coach? I mean, I think being aware of it is kind of the first step, which we we're seeing a lot of. Um, a lot of coaches are now aware that this is a problem and that they need to be more tuned in to their athletes. You know, are you having trouble? Like, are you depressed? Is this too much for you? Do you need a break? And I know when Madison had met with her coach at UPenn that he did take it seriously and he mm -hmm. said, you know, um, this is important. If you need to take a break, if we need to decrease practices, whatever it is, we'll do that. I just think that he also saw so much talent in her that he didn't want to give it up, her to give it up um, so quickly. Um, so I definitely think that, yeah, just being aware of it, making them feel like they have this safe space to talk about it also, uh, whether that's with you, whether that's with other teammates, uh, giving them that opportunity. So kind of just like, you know, breaking the stigma and letting them feel like they're open and safe to talk about their real feelings and what's going on and how how sports are affecting them. I know with a lot of athletes, uh, Madison was high achieving and she was always an athlete, like since she was a little kid. So um, <laughs> it was all she kind of knew and she was always good at everything that she tried, you know? So when she struggled with mental illness, I think it was something that she couldn't fix immediately. Uh, when it came to sports, she could always just, you know, practice running faster or training harder or changing her diet maybe. But this was something that I think was so hard for her to fix. And it, whatever she was trying at the moment obviously wasn't working. And I think that was just so crushing to her and crushing to a lot of athletes because their minds kind of work that way. You know, like I can fix whatever problem I have in front of me. And mental illness is not that way. So Absolutely. it can be, yeah, it can be a really like traumatic and and horrible feeling, especially in the moment. Yeah, and when you're an athlete, you know, you, you play games, you run sports, there's a set of rules, there's a referee right. to tell you when you're doing something wrong, like, you know, there's all these consequences for breaking the rules and you know to get back on track, and like you said, there's training, you get better and you can fix things, and there's a coach, um, and you have to be self-motivated to be an athlete. Right. Um, and so when something does break that you can't fix, it's really hard, there's no guidebook to it. Exactly. And, even you, and I say this, like, you can even read guidebooks on mental health, and it's yeah. still just not enough. And I feel part of what was interesting about her story is that um, it mentioned how she posted a lot of beautiful, inspirational quotes. Yes. And as a runner, you know, there's always like these correlations between like setting your mind free and running the long distances and like finding peace in your soul. <laughs> yeah. And I, that's beautiful. I, I, I appreciate anybody who can do that. And <laughs> I myself was able to do that for a very long time until it didn't work. And then right. I and she went for runs and she wanted to run for fun um, and it, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, and she was, there were still other things that she needed to find. And I'm one of those people that also had to find other things to yeah. work. And it, it's interesting how prevalent it is, um, speaking from the running side, because I am a runner, yeah. of how prevalent it is to say that running is my therapy mm -hmm. and running is my medication and I need to be athletic, and I need to do this, and like the miles are my medicine. And yeah. It's all beautiful, and there's these beautiful memes all over Twitter, and like these um, inspirational runners that you follow in their blog posts about like, I just got through it, yeah. I just yeah. toughed it out. And in the meantime, you know, lots of people are sitting back being like, I, what? Yeah. yeah. That didn't, I just ran 10 miles and that didn't work for right. me. Right, I felt um, the same that I did before. Yeah. <laughs> I, during the run it was great, but now I'm back home and the sweat right. has dried and I'm, this sucks. 
Right. Yeah, she um, used to love to run at a place called the Celery Farm. It's actually on our the website, mm -hmm. the picture of oh, it. Oh, really? And it's like really pretty colors, like green, and she found her, sal whatever she was found there for. was her little, she just loved to run there all the time. Mm -hmm. so. so when you tell the student athletes that are coming in, um, do you talk about having them find other coping skills and other coping mechanisms um, to reset? I feel like mm -hmm. one, of the prop no, one of the issues was that um, when you put everything into one thing, like mm -hmm. being an athlete, to be your saving grace, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit dangerous. You don't have the wide net of things. Um, do you touch on that when you talk to your athletes and the incoming freshmen and the teachers? Yeah, I mean, I've touched on the fact that, like, I think Madison kind of kept trying to find a reason that this was happening to her. Mm -hmm. And um, like we talked about before, it's probably a million different reasons. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I think at the towards the end, she kind of focused everything on track. And she was like, you know, if I can just quit track, like, I'll start to feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that that would have, I mean, it could have helped. I don't think that that was obviously the one reason why she was suffering. But I do think that because of track, running wasn't really fun for her anymore. Uh, she still liked to come home and use it as a workout and, and run for fun, but I don't think she was having fun in those moments um, with her team. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, if you're not finding happiness competing anymore, then maybe it is time to take a step back from that and find what does make you happy. And that can be so many different things, whether it's meditation, um, therapy, I know is just so beneficial to so many people, um, talking to a friend, being alone. Uh, it can be so many different things, but to try them out and just see what works for you, because once you do, then you get control back and you know I have this thing that I can do that makes me feel better. And it may not bring me back to where I want to be, but it could bring me back a few steps to where I at least need to be. And I think that's really important. Um, another takeaway from all of this and all the work that you've done with all of that is just making sure to let people know that it's okay to not be okay um, and that mm -hmm. it's okay to talk about it um, openly and say, hey, yeah. these are the things that are happening to me. Um, and this book was so beautiful and meaningful to me because of that and how just also it presented this wonderful person. Nothing traumatic happened to her. And I think a lot of people had this idea that depression affects people who have gone through something traumatic, like something has had to have happened to them to trigger it. Sure. But she was, she had a great life, 19 wonderful years of happiness and love, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you know, like something that was beyond her control. Yeah. Um, cool. So, moving forward with the work that you are doing, what are some next goals that you have for the foundation? For the foundation, we want to continue probably increasing our speaking mm -hmm. engagements and Really, the, um, we're, we're working closely with a company called Effective School Solutions as well as a K through 12 mental health program. So I think that'll be very beneficial for, you know. Wow. We're partnering with them actually too for a um, statewide scholarship. In so New Jersey. In, in the state of New Jersey, yeah. yeah. So I so think that's a. We're sponsoring a yeah. scholarship and the, the goal there too is to, again, get the word out break the stigma of mental illness, um, share Madison's story more, and get um, the people who are living it, these students, these young adults, get their ideas. You know, what we wanna know how to help more. What's the best mm -hmm. place to fi figure that out or find what to do next is to ask them. Um, it's kind of the simplest thing, you know, but like yeah. ask them, what can we do? What would help you if you are suffering? Uh, so I think that's a big step in the right direction for us as well. Um, and we work with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Their corporate headquarters is right here in New York City. So um, I know my dad's met with their CEO a lot and they have a goal for 2025 to reduce the suicide rate by 20%. 20% from, right, which, I mean, suicides have increased for the past two decades by 2% per year. So if yeah. we can help them, I mean, even just, you know, 20% is an amazing goal, so. Um, but I think, you know, just by talking about, you know, suicide and, you know, uh, letting 
people know it's all right, you know, it's okay not to be okay, and to get help is the biggest thing. We have this organization stigma free in our area and each town is kind of dedicating itself to becoming stigma free. And with that they do, you know, a walk and talk event or um, they pass out literature around town about um, what it means to be stigma free, what mental illness is, how to get help. So I think a lot of people now and a lot of towns, a lot of communities, a lot of states, uh, you'll, you're seeing this big push about it. Let's end the stigma. Let's talk about how we feel. Let's reduce the suicide rate, and let's all get help. You know, mental illness is just as important as physical illness, and the second that people realize that, we're gonna start helping ourselves and healing ourselves. Thank you. Yeah. I love that you're doing so much more. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic, it's really heartwarming. Thank you, Carly and James, for being here and talking about this. I know it was a loaded subject, and I really appreciate your openness and honesty and your continuing work with us. Um, I'd also like to thank the Manhattan Neighborhood Network and Will Sanchez for hosting us today. Hi, I'm Carly Boshoven. I'm the Director of Communications for the Madison Holler and Foundation. I just want to thank Will and Deanna for having us here today to talk about Madison and her story. The Madison Holler and Foundation started in 2014, shortly after my sister's death by suicide. And today we focus on ending the stigma, sharing her story to start a conversation, uh, talking about the book, What Made Maddie Run, that was written about her and what happened. Uh, and we just spread the news as much as possible to get out, talk about your feelings, find help, and start a real conversation. And you can find out more about us and what we do and how to help by visiting our foundation's website at www.madisonhollerandfoundation.org.